So have you guys had a good day so far? And we are sitting between you and drinks. Yeah. <laughs> always a tough place. We've got to be fascinating. We've got to be fascinating. Yes, got to be fascinating. Yeah, exactly. uh, and I can tell you, um, these are two of my dear friends. And I asked them to come because I love this community here so much. What happens at Startup Fest is an amazing uh, uh, energy that brings you all together. I know you've been talking amongst each other as, uh, as you've had breaks and sitting next to each other. And it really is a special place. And I encourage you, if this is your first time at Startup Fest, stay together and keep talking. And please ask people like us questions. So I'm going to ask a few questions. But what I'm hoping is that will seed more from you all. This is Lori Norrington. I met Lori while I was at Intuit. My first meeting with Lori <laughs> was a very controversial subject. It was something that Intuit had started years before was a customer management CRM product. And it had started and failed many times. And there were many different contentious players sitting around the room like you're going to face at times with your board. The way she handled it was amazing. I was just there. I'd only been there a couple of weeks. I didn't really know the culture of the company or anything like that. And Lori just went around the room and listened to everyone and then said, I see we have some disagreements. That's great. We're actually all here to work together. And here's how we're going to do it. That's something that I want you all to take with you is remember even in those tough times, and you're going to have them as a startup. This is my seventh startup. That even through those, there's guiding lights like Lori <laughs> that can get you through it. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Next thing I'm going to talk about is Nanon. And I met Nanon because of Lori and got on the phone with her talking about funding and seed stage. And she's investing in women, which is something that I'm very passionate about. But what Nanon has is an energy. And uh, it's... It's a joy about her and about what she's doing. Again, please seek those people out, those people that are going to have that joy, but also be able to tell you why there's a struggle. You know, I was introduced as being uh, with a description that was very buzzword laden. That's a problem. Nanon is the person that's going to joyfully tell me about my problems. This is someone that you want near you. So think about those things as you listen to them, as you listen to give their advice. One of the things that I ask from them is that they actually give you contrary to conventional wisdom. You're going to hear tons of conventional wisdom out there. What is it that they've found as, as nuggets mm -hmm. that are the contrary to conventional wisdom, pieces that you all need to know? So, Miss, do you guys have anything to add to that as we talk? Did I do okay? No, but it was, I, we're there now. I'm kidding, okay, I'm thank kidding. You. It's all good, it's all good. <laughs> no, I thought, I thought you did a great job, Jenna, because you're absolutely right. I mean, all these people in the room, it's tough. It's tough running a business. Every day you've got to get up there and slog it out and you're by yourself and you've got to lead everyone and show that you feel good and that you know all the answers. Well, you don't and you know that. And it's really, you get a little nervous. And so you need people to surround yourself by people who will encourage you, ask the tough questions, but also support you. So I think that's really an important issue. So you are the light. So I am the light. I'm trying to be. <laughs> The, the reason why this is so hard, and there's a, there's a reason why they had the founding stage and the funding stage. It's a big change, and there's a gap between those. Yeah. There's not an easy, easy ramp between the two, because you're going to have to change a lot of the things you're doing. And that's really, as we talked ahead of this panel, is what is the theme for us? It's really about change and how you navigate through it, which things you hold on to for dear life and which things you let go. So one of the first things that, that we talked about was how the vision, you know, you got through this early stage with this vision. You were yeah. so passionate about your idea and what you wanted to do. 
how does that change when you get to this next stage and now you've got this investors sitting around telling you, well, when you sold me this, it was this. And they saw your vision a little bit differently because we're never completely aligned. Yep. So, so what is it you've seen, Lori, as you've, because you do board work and you do investing work. Your investing work is more at the seed stage now. Mm -hmm. That's right. I started out in early, er, early seed and now I'm in B plus at this point. But, but I would say that the first thing is to really understand, and it gets back to that meeting so many years ago, what are you solving for? Are you solving for a certain customer segment? Are you solving for, I love my product and that is my vision? Making sure you understand what you're solving for and being very clear with the investors because that is gonna be critical. So many people go and get the slide share, you know, the top 10 or top five startup slide share decks mm -hmm. from Silicon Valley. And that is one of the most mislit, sure, you need to know what TAM is, you need to have a business model, you need to have a customer, you need to have a product. Okay, great. But really be clear with investors that, look, this is what I, my dream is to build. My dream is to build a great product company that can go public and that has a product that sells to customers. Or no, my product is to build, my dream is to build for SMBs to empower them to change the world. Um, that was Intuit's vision, right? So I think having that and being very clear with investors is absolutely critical to start off. The second thing, and it's going to sound a little contrary to the first one, is that you want to make sure that you stay flexible, right? The world is going to change. So How you architect product is going to change. How you sell over time will change. So make sure that you're changing with your board as you go forward. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about how that might take place and what kinds of resources you might have a little later on. But I would say make sure that you also know yourself well enough that you keep your mind open or you'll miss an opportunity, right? Because so many people say, oh, I have a vision. I got to execute on that and they miss the opportunity and, away. And to build on that, Lori, I think what started off when you're, I do mostly seed series A, and I've done a couple of series B, it's a very different, for lack of a better word, personality you show up with. You are the CEO, you're dragging your team members around, you're doing everything. The jobs, the roles are all very fluid. It's chaos when you're doing a startup. All of a sudden, when you start switching into series A and B, you've got to start putting some governance in. You've got to start doing some of the tough decisions which CEOs have to do, which is let some people go that got you from the seed to the series A or B. It's a different type of person you're looking for and that's really, really hard. But again, that's really important to do it well and that's how you set from the very early stages the culture of your company and how you build forward. Yeah, you, you shift very much from a player to a player coach at this stage. Yeah. And that's a hard transition. Ha having uh, one of the things that I've done is uh, come in to help entrepreneurs with that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they'd say, yes, you helped us. Uh, but, you know, it, it's hard to, I would often talk to them about the what versus the why. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, folks will cling so hard to the what and they're missing really the why, that, that heart of their vision instead of just the hand. And I don't know if you have some examples of that. And you know, I can talk about with Spreadshirt when we came in, Spreadshirt was a customization platform. And um, we had uh, almost gotten to profitability and then started losing money. And we needed a change because we couldn't sustain that. And so one of the things we did was we went back to focusing on, on clothes and just customizing clothes. And that was really hard. And, and we had these discussions. I said, look, we're still the, our why is bringing out customization and personalization. It isn't the what of having mugs as well as phone cases and things like that. And those kinds of things are hard. I don't know if you have some examples to help people crystallize those kinds of changes? Yeah, I've had a couple of companies and, and they'll go unnamed if that's yes, okay. But, totally fine. Um, I can say Spreadshirt because I was there. But one of the classic pitfalls that I've seen is companies decide that they want to sell their product to every segment. And so they start selling quickly across segments and they're like, oh, I have to build an enterprise sales force. Oh, I have to build a mid-market sales force. Oh, I have to build an SSO product. Can't do it all. Or they decide that they're going to diversify their product now. 
And in, in reality, at this stage, my recommendation is if you've got product market fit, make sure that you stick with that product market fit and focus on the segment, and then begin scaling within the segment because that will generate cash and that will generate a better funding base for you. You will have more choices of people. You will have more choices. You can delay funding. But many people miss that this stage is about this product market life cycle where you've got a product out there. Now, mm -hmm. if it's B2B, right, you're going to use sales to reach businesses. Or if it's B2C, you're going to use marketing to reach businesses and content. So thinking about how you sequence those two things um, should be a good portion of your headspace as a CEO. And I, I'd like to build on that because we had uh, one of the companies we invested in, it, we followed them from seed all the way, they're still going strong. And uh, they had difficulty moving from, they would get what we call in our whale deals, the big deals, the Microsofts, the Googles, and then they'd be like, yeah, we made our numbers, this is awesome. And I'm like, that's great right now as a startup. That's not sustainable as you move to A and B. And as a board member, we're going to come down really hard on you because we want to start seeing your numbers and we want to be able, that's how you build trust. You think you're going to get these numbers, you should be start reaching your numbers. Not when you're a startup, but to get there and what's going to be your sustainable bread and butter business that will keep your business going. The whale deals, yeah, they'll come in, great, let's celebrate. But what's your bread and butter? So that's the point yeah. that I think is so important. How many people are in software, have to run software businesses? Okay, so you've got some, we've actually got some physical businesses here. Yeah. If you're in a software business, this is highly relevant because you've got a stage where you can get to five million and then you've got to do exactly what Nanon said to get to 10. But you've got to make sure that you've got a mid-market business to get to 20. And if you can get to 20, you can generally get to 60, because that means that mid-market business is powering you to 60. If you can get to 60, you can often get to 120. Then it gets hard again, because you have to start diversifying product and market segments. So one of the things that you guys are both going around is, but don't do that. But we're often told to do this, right? I, I have investors that tell me, oh, you need to broaden the market or you need to get that well. Mm -hmm. If Microsoft's using you, everybody else will use you, yeah. right? Yeah. You get that, it's a credential almost. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you help them see, like, I agree with you, most, most uh, entrepreneurs are excited about the Microsofts or the Googles using their product. On the other hand, I'll also say the investors are often, and that, that's a, they're, they're pushing you that way as well. So uh, you're, you're the voice of dissent on that, <laughs> well, <laughs> on the board. So how do you help people see the rest of the people around the, uh, how do you get the rest of the people around the table there? Um, you mean the rest of the people around the table in the sense of Whether the, it's the venture capitalists, the, the boards? Whether it's the VCs that you're working with. Yeah, because yeah. you're also, if you're in seed and they go to A, right? right. You've got other board members there. Absolutely. And you're going, I don't think they should focus on that. Yeah. So I think that's a two two type answer. I think the entrepreneurs, when they're building up their company, they've got to get, because you never know what's good piece of advice, what is not good a piece of advice, right? And that's one of the key things they try to figure out. So they've got to surround themselves by great people. And what I mean by that is they have to go find advisors. They have to, not only your board, because what happens when you're a startup, if you're investing, so I take a seat on the board. If I'm investing, you want to know what's happening, and so you take a seat. The problem is that the person who's taking the seat on the board has, they just want to, oftentimes, VCs have to put that much money to play. They want to get their money in. You want to get diversity around the board. So you have to sit down and say, okay, let's look at these board members. Where are my holes? Where can I go get people that are going to help me out? Because that's going to be really important as you grow your business. And oftentimes, I find in my business, people will sit down and say, I want a Lori Norrington. She would be awesome. Better to sit down and do what we call a position description. Five key adjectives that you're looking for. Rate them on a percentage. Come down to 100% and see if someone like a Lori is the right person for you. Don't start with the name of the person. Work the other way. Yeah, I'd say the number one pitfall here is people look for stars, right? Yeah, they look yeah. for the big name. Yeah. If they run Microsoft, they must know the answer. Guess what? <laughs> 
They've never known what your business is like at Microsoft. Nobody has that yep. memory. They're either no longer on this earth or they're sitting on a beach, right? It just doesn't exist anymore. So I think it's very important to do exactly what you said, Manol. And I think I would also suggest that you think a little bit about what, are the, what is your business model? Because investors can do math, but they're not particularly good at strategy or business models. And I'm an investor, okay? And so it's amazing. What rings the cash register at the end of the day, right? We've, you can burn through a ton of money because investors have an incentive. And this is one of the big secrets of the world, right? Is that if the bigger the fund, the more money they want to put in you. The more money you take, the less efficient you will be by definition. You, you want to be hungry, you want to be fast, you want to make sure that you don't, uh, you're more likely to die from overeating as a startup than from mm -hmm. starvation. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I just went through that with my company. So we were raising money and uh, I was the only one on a five person board, board to vote that we take less money. And um, I said, I want to be clear, this is not an ultimatum. I love the company. I'm very passionate about what we're doing, but we're already raising more than we went out to raise. And now you want to add to that. And I said, look, what's going to happen is you all are going to want me to spend that money. And they said, no, no, we'll be conservative. It's just in case of a rainy day. It isn't. And immediately after that, they said to me, but what if we want to hire that one person? Remember that superstar, that person from Microsoft that you were talking about, Lori? Exactly. They just became available. <laughs> right. That knows everything and about a business that's $3 million and $256 billion. Woo! Genius. Yeah. But yeah. Jenna, they also hear a lot of people telling them, you're going to run out of money. 85% of startups fail. I can't run out of money. i got to take as much as I need, right? Yeah, but it's, it's your responsibility to manage it. Yep. And this goes back to another point that we talked about, which is the team and how the team changes. Right. You know, as you're, as you're a startup and in that early founding phase, you know, you're excited when people join you and oftentimes they'll join you for free, right? And they're, they're putting their sweat equity in too. But it's a big difference when you graduate to this level and now you have somebody else's money that you're spending. You need to get some financial professionals in, whether that's on your board or in your advisors or someone that you hire to really understand where is that money going. And, and to build on that, I think that you need the experience. But one of the mistakes one of our companies did, they said, okay, brilliant woman, I'm going to go to one of the big companies, $200 billion in revenue. I'm going to bring her in because she's so good at what she does wrong person to bring in. She's never run a startup. She was in a big company. And what she, we really needed was someone that could take it from the 2 million to the 20 million. So make sure you know what you're looking for, what type of person. And the right person in the right seat is so important yeah. at that point. I think that's critical also to make sure that the board members that you're going to bring on, and, and remember, it's up to you. By the way, you always have early stage board members, right, in your seed stage. But one of the things that you have to decide with your new investors is do you want to keep them? How many people do you want around the table? Fewer is always better. Do you want to reserve, by the way, to have an independent at this stage? Or two independents, which are your call, not theirs. Yes, right? have an independent. So I'll just answer that question for you. Perfect. <laughs> um, and it matters, and I've seen it the other way. Yeah, and what happens is you've got to watch the power shift of you know, money is always creating pressure, right? Good pressure, bad pressure. Make sure that you have somebody that doesn't have that dog in the fight, right? It's got to be somebody that is thinking independently, that certainly has interest in your company, but is thinking about the long term, is not thinking about, well, wait a minute. Oh, look, we see a bright star out there. Let's go invest. Actually, to Jana's point, you want to get the data now. When you start to make revenue, when you start to get some momentum around this, you start to say, wait a minute, where's the money going? What am I spending on? And, and the investors, by the way, will say, well, what's your CAC to LTV? And let's look at all these metrics. The answer is you don't know at this point. Think about what your, if, what's your payback for a salesperson. If they pay back in 12 months, great, hire another one. Make it simple and understand where the money goes because you would be amazed. 
90% of the companies that I see at stage, that, that C, that can't get to the next level, and the A's that can't get to B's, is because they didn't know how they spent their money. And you know, I think there's a special challenge in Canada, maybe, that there's... There are. We have shreds in Canada. Everyone here, we've used... Government's been very helpful to us, which we don't have in the U.S. In my American companies well, I've invested we're, in. If we're going to comment on U.S. politics, I could go on all day long. <laughs> yeah. And shreds are a great help, but... As a company, I tell my startups that are moving into Series Bs, don't depend on that shred. You have to be able to run your company without having that extra money. Yes, it's wonderful. It got you off the ground fabulous. But you've got to start thinking about it as your company is self-sufficient. Really, really important. Really important. I mean, one of the things that we look for, so I work for a, we call ourselves the non-venture venture company. Um, and the reason for that is because we only have a couple of institutions. We have 350 ex-C-suite executives and ex-entrepreneurs. So we've got about 50 ex-entrepreneurs, about 300 ex-C-suite executives. And one of the things we look for is we look for a high capital efficiency. So say you have $10 million of revenue, right? I know you're not there yet, but someday, right? You keep fighting, you get there. How much money did you spend to get to that 10 million? They don't care where the money came from. Yep. We'll look at, okay, were, was it capital efficient? When times get tough, do you know how to you know, pull the team together, to rally them, to focus them, to execute? And, and to build on that, Lori, for example, the, the KPIs, that's a big thing in the Valley. People have to all have the same numbers. When you start growing a company, before everyone was doing a little bit of everything. That's no longer. You've got to have clear job descriptions so people know what they're doing. What numbers are you using and measuring across the company? That's really important. And yeah. Some people aren't going to be happy about it. It's change. People don't like change. But that's what CEOs do so well and have to do, yeah. is realize, yeah, these are the tough things. I've got to make these decisions. I've got to start you know, doing things, and people might not like me. It's no longer about being liked and your buddies when you started the startup, You know, the small five, ten people. Now you've got to bring in some people. And as long as you're respected, that's the new word for the CEO, respect. You won't be liked. Yeah. And Nan, how do you how do you do that though? Because it is hard. You have someone yeah. who's been with you from the beginning. Yeah. It's not unusual that they put their sweat equity in, and now all of a sudden they aren't the right person for the job, for what for making the the cash register ring. Mm -hmm. And so, how do, how do you counsel you know the CEOs and Jenna? I thought it would get easier. I've always seen that whether you're a seed, an A, a B. And I remember once on stage, I was at a big conference. It was Jack Welsh, Ariana Huffington, Jeff Bezos, and the person asked them, "What is the toughest decision? The the, the de decision you had to make?" And they said, "Well." The one regret, and it was across the board, I should have gotten rid of that person early on. They might have been brilliant, they might have been great, but they didn't work together as a team. You need the team. All of a sudden you're growing, you need to have your people. You can't be doing everything. That's what you did as a startup. Now you're moving into a different area where you've got to delegate, and your people that you find, find the best people. Give them responsibility. Because you need that. You need to move it all forward. You can't do everything. And I would say it's a challenge when you think about the best people. I would say think about the people you need for the yep. next two years. Excellent. Don't, don't yep. bring that person in yep. from the $256 million company. That person, if somebody has taken a company from C to A and A to B, great. Hire them. But really think about those are the kinds of people that you need. And you don't need 20 of them. You need a couple of them to help you really understand where to take the business and how to build as a team. And I think the most important thing in addition to that is you've got to start putting the company first, right? When you're in seed mm. stage, the people come first because it's all about the people. Without the people, you have no product. You can't yeah. build it. Yeah. When you get beyond that and you really start thinking about A and B, you've got to start thinking about, okay, what is best for the company? If this is our vision for the company, what's that got to look like? And it's really hard. I've seen some CEOs almost take down businesses. And, and the first question I ask them is, what are you solving for? You're trying to help the person that clearly is not getting the message, clearly doesn't have the skills and experience to do this, or are you trying to build a company? And that sounds heartless, 
but but you can't solve for all of those things at the same time. And Lori, to build on that, I think it's a really important question for the CEO to define success because how you define success will be felt throughout the company. And that definition will evolve. Nothing, there's not one company I invested in that's the same as it was when I invested in. People will change, your <coughs> vision will modify, that it will be different, but you have to have that ability. What is success for you? I think, <coughs> sorry, now I got something. Here, you can have that. <laughs> that's what friends do. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> there we go. You guys have me speechless. Um, <laughs> I think that's one of the key things is um, it's actually heartless to leave somebody in that position Yeah. because they're struggling, and yeah. I know it's hard. I, I mean, I, I, I've been there, and it's been friends that we've had to separate. Um, this is serious. And them and you letting the company fail because of that is is horrible for both of you and they know it they know they're struggling they're trying and it's not it's not gelling together and I, I'd say I know exactly why like you said even these people that are running these gigantic companies feel that way is because that's the hardest thing to do whoever helped bring you to this point yeah. you want to be loyal and people call it loyalty and you're actually not being loyal to that person yeah. because you're not you're not letting them go when they need to go for themselves as well and i would just add that i think you have to do the same thing for a board member right i sit mm. on a board right now it's a 30 billion a 30 million dollar company I wish it was 30 billion that's our vision uh <laughs> and uh it's amazing uh they have a um one of the original founding investors that's been on the company board for seven years, he's never seen a company bigger than $10 million. So he's very supportive of the CEO. And so I, as I say to the CEO, that's great that he's supportive. It's wonderful, right? I'm supportive of the CEO. And, and I can help you map your business model and actually help you understand what metrics you want. Which one of us do you want? Do you want another me or do you want another him? And it's very difficult for these people to kind of let go of their friends. And it's like your board members are not your friends. Not everybody will grow to the sky, right? They will not be able to go on that journey with you. Um, and this is why it's so important to pick investors because I see many times a stage in, uh, uh, entrepreneurs will bring in, will keep somebody that's nice and supportive of them because they're afraid of the VC. And the VC starts asking tough questions and they feel like they're under the gun. Guess what? Really make sure that, you know, you're not just selling a VC, you're buying. And making sure that you really understand how they're going to add value. Because sometimes, guess what? They don't give you good advice. Sometimes you have VCs that have absolutely no experience in your business model or your market or your customer base. So, and that may be your only choice. So as you're negotiating the deal, make sure that you negotiate in independent board members and that you tell them you're going to have an advisory board and give them equity. Because some people, some VCs block that later on. So it's very important that you give yourself that flexibility as a CEO, not only with, with employees, but also with board members and advisors. And also with the VCs, you get to choose your VCs. It is a marriage. In good times, everything's great. But when things get tough, you want to build that relationship with the VC that gets to know you, that will be there, that will help you, that will ask the tough questions. Yep. Because I believe okay. in tough love. You okay. grow, you become better. But it's scary. And I've been there, yep. and so have many of my friends. Yep. You know, you say choose your VC, yep. but, <laughs> you know, finding the one at the right time, <laughs> it, it's not that easy. Absolutely. And, and you do a lot of pitches, <laughs> and you get turned down a lot. And, and one of the things that I'll say, and, I, and I'd love to get your feedback on this, there are alternative forms of funding, and don't be ashamed of those. Don't be ashamed of lines of credit bridge loans, all of this, bring that in because give yourself the time to find that right marriage. And you start early. You don't start when you need it. I, you start, I mean, one of the role of the CEOs is you constantly are looking for great people to hire. No matter what, that is one of the true north star for a CEO. Who are the best people? Who I want on my board? What VCs do I want? Who do I want on my team? You are constantly looking for those people because you're only as good as your people. They're the ones that are going to 
give out the great product or service, and they're the ones that are going to make the profit. So I think that whether it's a board member, you start early. Because I can think of an example of one of our companies where it ended up, the fellow came on as a venture, he was not a venture capitalist, he was in business, and he ended up acquiring the entire business. Because he, he sat on the board with us, he got to know the players, and he said, I see what, something very interesting. Right. And so you want to nurture those partnerships and start looking for people that can add value, that can maybe, who knows, in the future acquire. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons that CAS conservation is so important. Because, by the way, we just, I, one of our marketplaces in our portfolio at Lead Edge is about a $50 million marketplace now, doing really well. But guess what? They burn a lot of cash. So we just took out some venture debt, and we're not touching it. It's just sitting there. Doesn't that sound crazy? But it's sitting there because once we find, we have a big data platform now. We're really mining tons and tons of data over a seven-year longitudinal period, right? Once we find something that works, we'll have the cash to invest against it and it will be capital efficient. Until then, we're gonna hold that venture debt. But I think it's really important to make sure that you have lots of different places to go. By the way, the private equity world has changed. I mean, I've only been in it five years. Before that, I ran a business. Um, it's crazy, right? I don't know if anybody just saw the Goldman Sachs announcement last week. They're putting together four funds that are gonna be larger than SoftBank and KKR. It's insane, right? There's more private equity money out there than historically has ever been. So you can, you have a little bit more room. To your point, it's not always easy to access, but finding, and this is why your network is important, and finding people like Jana and like me and saying, oh, is that what you're solving for? Then I have this friend called Nanol, and she invests in these kinds of business. Or if you have a SaaS company out there, Nanol will say, hey, Lori invests in those kinds of businesses. Why don't you do that? But the network, mm -hmm. it's not just, you know, I live in Silicon Valley, so it's not just the Sequoias. It's not just the Andreessen's. It's not just the people that you read about in Silicon Valley that you can get money from. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunities, and I wouldn't just ask, you know, this goes back to advisors and networks, and depending on your employees, who, who they are and what experience they have, if you don't have someone that's just been at a big company that has done this, and talk about these things, and talk about the cash. I'm, I'm very transparent with our team uh, about uh, cash. They know. And they know where we are and they know what we're spending it on because they know what rings the register, yep. which is important. But I want to shift now because we'll talk forever. So what questions of yours haven't we mm -hmm. answered? Oh, my God. Who, who's got a question yeah. that... <laughs> That's my brother. Wait, oh, we got a microphone. <laughs> oh. There you go. Uh, full transparency, I'm related to Nano. My uh, brother. <laughs> but Nano, you've been investing for many years. If you could go back 10 years, what are the three things you would tell yourself 10 years ago? And what kind of, I know it's different stages, but what kind of CEO are you looking for to invest? Because at the end of the day, you're investing in people. So the two questions are, what are the 10 things you would tell yourself 10 years ago after all this learning you've done? And what's the ideal CEO you're looking for and why? Okay. So um, I didn't plant that question. So I'm going to start with the, the type of CEO, because that's so easy that comes to mind really quickly. We all want someone who's gritty. Why? Everyone's going to tell you no. Everyone's going to tell you you can't make it. I want the person that keeps on working when everyone else says you can't do it. I want someone who's super resourceful. You've got to reinvent your company. You've got to say, okay, I tried this, it didn't work, I'm going to change my strategy and try this. So that's really important. I want someone who's bright and who's able to go and find great people and get them to follow her or him. That's really important for me. So I also would like someone who's done it before because then I can, it reduces my risk. That's what I would do. So what I've learned along the way, I think there's tons of great ideas out there. It's all about implementation. It's all about the people working together and doing something when everyone says that's not going to be possible. So I think that would be one of the great learnings. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was completely enamored with a few years ago was the, the next best idea, right? And unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> guess who has often the next best idea in this world? Google and Facebook and some of the behemoths. 
Today, what I look for is where is that place that they're not going to go um, <laughs> that we can build a real business, a sustainable business? Um, and what, how do we create optionality with that business? I mean, one of the things I, again, was very enamored by the one vision. Oh my God, guess what? Do you know how many companies I saw run up on the rocks because of the one vision? Um, in fact, it took a couple of, the, the, at the last minute, we bought a couple of Janas in that had done this before to pull the companies out and go, wait a minute, you know, we can play here and we, we either have one option. In a good world, you have an option to keep playing. In a not so good world, you have an option to sell and have a buyer. In a really bad world, they go up on the rocks. So I think those two things have been huge for me. And the CEO is often steering them up on the rocks because of the advice that they're listening to. Absolutely. I'll be honest. I, I mean, no, no, I'll give, my you an, job. I'll give you a great example. Um, uh, there's a company in Boston that I used to advise, you know, very well. It was about a $75 million company. They raised a huge round. Uh, I was in a board meeting because I was an advisor. Uh, I got into a huge argument with somebody, um, their initials are CRV. Um, uh, you, can, you can decide who that is. I said, In we, Boston. Yeah, exactly. I said, we have to decide what we're going to do with unit economics in this business. We are literally throwing out dollars for every customer that walks in the door, right? Their marketing dollars, their operations dollars. We have to decide where we're going to be efficient. And they said, we don't. We don't have to decide that. You're thinking too small. We don't have to decide. I said, well, we've burnt through $50 million in cash. We haven't proven we can, we can achieve unit economics, much less scale economics. Guess what? They convinced the CEO to sell, to go out and run a huge marketing campaign, 25 million. Four months later, they fired him. He did exactly what they said. Never do exactly what your board says. Make sure you understand your business model. Make sure you understand the math. They won't understand the math the way you do. But they guess won't. what? If you don't understand the math, you have no other choice to listen to them. And this CEO couldn't argue the math, and he lost that business based on it. And I'll say it goes back to being gritty. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. that, that takes some um, intestinal fortitude to stand up to the people who approve your budget, <laughs> uh, and they're approving that $25 million yeah. spend, right? And it takes something to stand up to them because all they're going to see is what you lost. Because yeah. in their mind, right. that's the winning advertising campaign that just pushed you into the right metrics. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's and doesn't happen. challenging. And, and the, I think, high, the high energy, too. Because they've yeah. got to be raising the money yeah. and keeping running the business. <laughs> that is damn You tough. guys need to be higher energy. Yeah. It's over there. The light. <laughs> Come on. Oh, I see it. I see a few of them. Oh. Uh, first of all, question. thank you for this amazing uh, end to a fantastic day. Thank you for being here. Um, all this advice is great, but then I look at like Dropbox, and there's this famous line about Dropbox that everyone knew cloud storage was a solved problem, but fortunately the founders of Dropbox didn't know that. Clearly, Dropbox, everyone would assume that would come out of Google or Microsoft or someone big. Same thing for Zoom. Hangouts are free, but Zoom is crushing it. Messaging apps existed, but Slack is crushing it. How do you, as an investor or a board member, look at a thing that seems to be a solved problem and still say yes, even though everything in the market says that's a solved problem someone else should own? Go ahead. You can so, so, for example, we've just done an investment in workflows, which has been an ancient problem that people have been trying to solve. Um, it, it's amazing to me. If, if you look at the solutions that are out there, why was Zoom so successful? Because nothing else works unless you spend $250,000. It's simple. That's why it's important for you to look at your competitors, but be pragmatic about them. What are the price points? What, the, what do the customers buy? At, how do they package things? Really understanding. Dropbox, I mean, Drew can tell you this story. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I got frustrated because I had to keep things on, what were those things that we used to stick into USB thumb, ports? Thumb drives. Thumb drives. That's right. God, it seems so long ago, right? And it was like, oh, well, you know, it was crazy. In fact, I had the argument with him. If he wanted to go after enterprise, he had to get safety. And he said, no, I don't. My product's perfect. Where did they, who beat him to enterprise? Box. So there's always somebody looking at 
that product. And, and sometimes people won't naturally go there. That's why it's important to understand the DNA of the behemoth and to get some advisors that might have done business with those behemoths before and really, really focus on what can you do well. And if you do it well, is there a big enough need? Look at how much we message in our personal life, for God's sake. Like I see offices of 200 people in some of my boards where they're literally emailing one another. They need a real-time communication. And, and guess what? Nobody in Silicon Valley feels comfortable actually, they're not extroverts, right? They want to sit and code. That was where Slack was picked up. That's where Atlassian was picked up, right? So it's, it's really a focus on who's, what is an underserved market or a non-served market. And you say, oh, Zoom. But guess what? Nothing else works. And, and to build on that, you know, just to even take something really simple. Let's not get complicated. Coffee. Starbucks. Like, who would have thought? What do you do? You study your customer. Who are they? How are they buying? What are they looking for? The issue is they tell you one thing, all those dating sites, when you do dig and find out the research, they say they want the tall, skinny blonde that looks great, but they keep dating the small little brunette that's adorable. Well, then maybe you start using the AI and the data to start looking at that data. Now we have that. We have the data. Let's use it. We haven't done as well. I think that's something. I thought the tall, skinny blonde was coffee. <laughs> and then you started, and I got confused. So I'm, I'm still back on coffee. <laughs> but I, I think you guys are, are bringing up something that it, it's so easy. And Alistair, I'm so glad you asked that question. Yeah. Because it's really easy to say, oh, Facebook or Google or Amazon will solve that. And, and they actually, they knew how to do cloud storage for themselves, but they didn't actually know how to do it for a consumer. Yep. And so that, that's the thing that I would say is you had someone that was passionate with that problem that they'll solve better. And that, that's what doesn't, that goes back to why somebody from a lot of these big companies doesn't transfer well into the startup is because, yeah, they know cloud storage, but they don't know the problem you're solving, where the friction is. And I think that's the thing that I'd look at is how do you, how do you figure out where the friction is? with uh, some of these things that, that are not being solved well by the players, whether it's with money or, I mean, have you used? It's not over 250K. It's also, like, those products just don't work. They like, don't work. They don't work. I mean, I don't know how many. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, right? the, the quality, you're yeah. paying 250K, yeah. and it doesn't work. So let's, is there another question? Because I want to... Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for coming and giving us this enlightening talk. Uh, my name is Jose. I'm coming from Mexico City. All the way down, used to wow. learn about the environment in here. And my question is related to that. Uh, what is the thought of VCs on US and Canada uh, about Latin America? Uh, I want to know if they're relevant to you, or is you prefer to be focused on where you're sitting? That I'd like to know a little bit more about it. So I, I would say that most big VC firms are very focused on Latin America, right? Because they're global, they have teams there, uh, they're a strong network. Let's just take Brazil, for example. Mercado Libre has incredible presence, literally gave birth to an entire VC community in Sao Paulo. It's, it's insane. Um, look, any time you have population, uh, you are going to have VCs. So I think what's important is, do you ha is the technology and the infrastructure mature enough? And, and oh, by the way, since most companies are starting funds focusing on Africa, I would say yes, it's very mature. You may have to be mobile first. You may have to have a different approach in communicating with your customers like through SMS. But that is going to be, I think, something that VCs, they've embraced it. I mean, look, look at India, look at Ola, look at Flipkart, look at Pickett. I mean, there was a $700 million Africa fund just raised, right? And they're completely focused on what is not a smartphone and how to solve problems with what is not a smartphone, okay? So it's fascinating. So I would say absolutely, and I think Mexico City is a right place, given the population density of Mexico City, and there's a huge entrepreneurial community there, absolutely. And I'll add to that. Um, we, so started a program, don't tell my um, investors about this, okay? This is just in this room. <laughs> um, actually inspired at Startup Fest. 
and um, Chris Shipley was giving a talk on how we give back and B Corps and things like that. And so I went back to my team and said, you know, I'd like to give back. And so inspired by Tom's buy one, give one, you know, Tom's shoes, mm -hmm. I said, what if we do a sell one, give one? And every time we sell a version of our enterprise, because it's big enterprise software, uh, we're actually going to find a nonprofit that could use our software as well and help them use it. Again, that's between us, guys. One of the people that we found is Endeavor. And Endeavor actually is a community that um, they, they bring entrepreneurs together. They have them in a class. They structure introductions to VCs and finding the right VC yep. is very important. Um, so I'd encourage you to find, there's always those kinds of groups and they were, they were started in Latin America, they're um, global now. There's all of these types of groups. That's what I'm saying is when you're sitting there and you're thinking, I'm all alone and there's nobody that can help me because they don't understand the problem I'm having, I promise you, having been through this seven times, there's always someone that can help you. You can do this. You may have to change your vision a little bit. You may have to figure out what it is that's really going to ring the cash register. You may have to let that person go that you love dearly. You can solve this, and we need you to solve it because startups are, are our vitality in the world which is exciting. Sorry, now I'm getting off. No, no, I was just saying, actually, it, I, to me, it's highly relevant. One of the books that, uh, you know, getting stuck in the vision is a very, very common thing. One of the books I'm recommending to my earlier stage CEOs is called Emotional Agility, right? Because Great. we know that agility is the number one thing that will create success going forward. The world's moving too fast. There's too much data. There's too much of everything. Um, but if you can emotionally manage yourself, then you can influence others. And this is where I want to go back to a point that you raised, Jana, which is about boards, right? They can be daunting. Guess what? I've been on 15 boards now, everything from Colgate Palmolive to, I mean, the smallest seed you were on startup. on TaskRabbit. I was in on TaskRabbit. I was on Develop World. Anybody heard of that? Of course you didn't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there were, I, I've been on a lot of boards. So I have, I'm not counting the privates, I'm just counting the public boards at this point. No board wants to see a CEO fail. No board really wants to take the CEO out of the job. So part of the question is, for you is, stop thinking that you're pitching to your parents or somebody that you have to impress and pitch to your partner. Think about Picket, your dog, your life partner. Think about somebody that's in it for you, that's loyal for you. That's generally what your investors are. Sure, do they ask tough questions? Are they there to make sure that you don't run out of money? Of course. But guess what? It goes back to Jana's meeting that she talked about at the beginning. I asked one question. I said, we all have different opinions, but we're all solving for one thing, and that's a customer here. So let's focus on solving for the customer. And that's generally all your investors want. Can we have one more question? Is there one more? No more? We answered them all? <laughs> Did you have one? No? Oh, Alistair's going to jump in. Oh, we've got... No, 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 no Alistair. No, no, no. You can't. I've got... Up, up front. There you oh. go. Oh, pastor. Sorry. Sorry, I'm going to... We have two more. <laughs> we've we have got two, two people work. We'll do two more. Quick. We'll do two more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I met the question for the startup company, for the star ICT company. We do something for renovation, innovation in the market. But in the market now, you see in the Google, Amazon, uh, the Facebook, they have to do the same way with us. But when we go in the market, we're very difficult to compete with them. So do you, in the venture capital, do you have any idea how we go into the market and how we, 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 we compete with the big brand name? Yeah, that's all. So, so I just want to make sure that I understood the question. The question is, I have a product that's already working in a certain market, but when I go to another market, the big guys are there already serving it. So how do you expand then within your market? So I'll, I'll, I, I'll give my answer because I, I've been in that situation before with uh, Spreadshirt. So Spreadshirt was a customization platform. And here in North America, Vistaprint and um, custom 
Custom Ink and, oh my gosh, Fred's company. Yeah, uh, starts with a Z. Yeah. It, uh, keep talking. I'll anyway, think of it. yeah, Zazzle. Zazzle, thank Zazzle. you. Zazzle. Yep. And Cafe Press. So all of those were bigger than us. We were the European leader. They were the U.S. leaders and at different strata, stratas. And um, so, you know, the question was, how do we compete? We competed. We decided where we would differentiate ourselves. And this was part of why we focused on clothing, because we found that they were doing more cheap shirts. And we actually started bringing in some designers to design our shirts better. So we picked something that was specific, whereas they were doing postage stamps and they were doing mugs and they were doing posters and all of this. We could say, hey, look, if it's going on your body, you care about it much more. And that's where we're going to focus. And we grew that business. Um, so when I joined, um, we were a, about 12 million, um, and we grew it to over 50 million in, in three years. So buy that with that focus. Yeah, so it's amazing. I mean, markets are massive, right? We're connected in ways we've never been connected before. And focus is the one thing that I can see small companies doing, and they, they can wedge their way in. And guess what? Again, if, if you bump up against them too much or they come down, um, they're more likely to buy your, you and your mm -hmm. talent than they are to say, okay, wait a minute, I'm going to change my balance sheet here, or I'm going to add the 190th team to go work on this. Because guess what? A lot of these guys have competing teams to do things, right? So it's, I think just focus is the key to any of that. So um, we are out of time now. But I wrote down some things that um, I felt were the most important. Um, and that's just from my perspective that I, I'd like you to think about. So the first thing is, ask yourself if you're gritty. <laughs> this emotional agility, resilience, it's absolutely critical at this stage because you're changing so much. Before, it was about being steadfast in your vision and holding on and really making sure you were making it clear to people what you were doing. Now it's about how do I keep that why while I'm changing the what and the who all around it. And so that's a much different skill and it does take, I'm glad you said the word gritty because it takes that grit that's going to stay around. The second thing is really think about this. You were thinking day to day before. Now this is about thinking out two years. And two years is a long amount of time, and it's hard to envision that. You're going to have, you know, really starry-eyed, but I'm talking about the reality of two years. Where are you really going to get? You're not going to be competing with Facebook in two years. You're not going to be that big, yeah. right? So really, what is it? And Nanon, you brought this up. Write it down. Yep. Writing things down, there, there's a link. I do a lot of neuroscience now. There's a link with our brain. Writing things down will make a huge impact on what you're thinking, and too few people use that tool. Write it down for yourself. Scratch it out, change it, think differently. Then the last one that I'm going to say is that I think is really important is stay hungry is important. Don't spend all that money. Start feeling like you need you know, to be fulfilled, and remember that, that that's just going to be a sugar high all of that money. So stay hungry and keep going. And then I, the last thing is, and this is audience participation, we have to sing happy birthday to someone here on the stage. <laughs> so would you guys, today is Nanon's birthday. She spent her birthday with us. <laughs> wow. Marie's advice and vote this the best <laughs> session ever because you get cake. <laughs> <laughs>
thank you all for coming and thanks for all the awesome questions. And we really appreciate you listening today and we can't wait to hear what you do with the advice. Thank you. Go for thanks. it. Yeah. <laughs>